First of all, thank you to A Lovelace Day for allowing me to share the stage with such an amazing group of women. Um, so yes, tonight I'm going to take you on a deep sea journey. My name is Diva Raymond and I am a deep sea biologist. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, but I'm currently at the Natural History Museum in London. And there, my research focuses on trying to answer two basic questions. Firstly, what lives in our world's deep oceans? And secondly, how are we humans impacting it? And to do my research, I spend between one and three months a year out on a ship in the middle of the ocean, getting to use an insanely cool suite of tools. So I get to use submersibles, which are the ones you actually go in down into the deep sea, get to use remotely operated vehicles or ROVs, which are robots that we do not go in, but are about the size of a car, and we send down into the deep ocean to do our dirty work for us. And I'm not gonna lie, I absolutely love what I do. There are very few careers that allow you to be amongst the first people on the planet to see a species, to see a habitat, and it really is the most humbling experience. Um, to be a deep sea scientist, you really do get to be a real life explorer. So the deep ocean is really the epitome of out of sight, out of mind. It is this place that we cannot exist. Um, it is a place we don't think really occupies much context in our day-to-day -day lives. And we're finding now that the more we look, the more we explore, there is much more to be found in our oceans than previously thought. So what is the deep ocean? Well, it's everything from 200 meters depth all the way down to just under 11,000 meters in the Marianas Trench, which is the deepest point on our planet. And that is everything that is blue on this map. So you can see that's a huge area. In fact, it's about over 60% of our ocean surface and about 96% of all habitable space on Earth. That makes it our largest ecosystem by far. And so we know it's vast, and that vastness leads to remoteness. And that remoteness makes it really difficult to study. You need very big ships that are capable of going far to sea for a very long period. Um, and when we get on those ships, we use incredibly high-tech pieces of equipment that cost quite a lot. And so because the deep ocean is such a difficult place to work, it means that a lot of it is actually really unexplored. Um, we actually have better maps of Mars, Venus, and the Moon than we do our own deep sea floor. Very cliche, I know, but true. Um, and we actually, our deep ocean floor is only mapped at about five kilometers resolution, which means that we'd be missing huge swaths of London if we were to put it into the same context. And not only do we have little maps, but that means that you know, maps are just one tiny part of the puzzle. They only give us a hint at what's down in the deep sea, but actual exploration, actually being able to see what's down there, well, only about 1% of our deep ocean has ever really been explored. And that's a staggering figure, considering we're talking about our own planet, right? So, if we can't answer, you know, that the most basic question for our deep ocean of what lives there, how are we supposed to answer questions about, you know, how old does this animal get? What does it eat? What role does this species play in our ecosystem? And if we can't answer those questions, how are we supposed to answer questions about how are we impacting life in the deep sea? And if we can't answer that question, how are we supposed to come up with solutions? So, if we were to go into the deep sea, what would it be like? Well, a lot like this image. So a lot like this image, it's really dark. Once you go past 400 meters, there is no light. Also, temperatures tend to hover just above freezing, about two degrees, and there are really, really high pressures. So for every 10 meters you descend into the ocean, you gain the equivalent of one atmosphere, or what we're feeling now, of pressure. So if you go down to about 3,000 meters or three kilometers depth, then you gain 300 times the pressure we're feeling right now. And if you were to switch on the lights, a lot of the deep sea would look like this. So this is a picture taken from the North Atlantic at about four kilometers depth. And one of the big issues with the deep ocean is that because of the lack of light, there are no plants. And that lack of plants means that there's not a lot of food to go around. So in fact, a lot of the food in the deep ocean actually comes from the sea surface in the form of dead plankton, dead animals, dead plants that drift down the thousands of meters into the deep sea. And because of that, it means there's not really a lot of food to go around. 
So, but just like on land, there are a variety of habitats. There are abyssal plains that are flat and sedimented. There are mountains with coral gardens on them. There are gushing volcano-like hydrothermal vents that have black fluid that is superheated being emitted from them. There are whale skeletons that form entire ecosystems. And just, not just that, there are trenches, there are cold seeps, there are brine lakes. You name it, it's down there. Not really, but kind of. <laughs> and with that amazing diversity of habitats comes an amazing diversity of life. These animals have to cope with such extreme conditions that it means you end up with some things that really make you scratch your head. Things that are extremely weird, but really wonderful. We find higher rates of gigantism, think giant squid, high rates of dwarfism, a lot of things in the deep sea are really tiny. Think about that also there's really, really high, well, really, really great, sorry, longevity. In fact, there are some corals off Hawaii that have recently been found that are over 4,000 years old. That's when the wheel was invented, people. Very old. Also, we know that a lot of animals can cope with really you know, extreme conditions. Low temperatures, high temperatures, extreme pressure, extreme chemical concentrations, just a place of extremes. And also, we're not sure whether this is a sampling artifact, but we think that a lot of species in the deep sea are appearing to be pretty rare. So, why is the deep sea important? Why should we care? Well, of course, I'm sure many of you in the room know, the ocean is incredibly important. And the deep ocean is the majority of that. We know that the deep, with that great size comes great responsibility. There, the deep ocean provides ecosystem services that keep our planet healthy and keep us alive. It sequesters carbon, regulating our climates. It detoxifies our oceans. It cycles nutrients. And more and more, our deep ocean is fast becoming a source of crucial resources. Things like minerals, oil and gas, fish or food, pharmaceuticals, and that's only increasing. And something which we tend to undervalue about the deep ocean is its ability to inspire us. It is a place that has spawned numerous movies, books. There are entire artists that dedicate their work to the deep ocean, a few, but they're there. And, you know, that's really something that shows just what an enigmatic place the deep sea really is. So because it's Ada Lovelace Day and we're here celebrating women in STEM, I figured I'd focus on some females in the deep sea. So we're going to look at the ladies of light, three of them, in the darkness of the deep. So, first, <laughs> some of you may have heard of this. This is Osidax, the bone-eating worm, lives in the deep ocean. And... I mean, what a niche thing to do. Um, so basically, they live on skeletons of whales. Whales die, they drift down into the deep sea, they prop this feeding bonanza. Once the flesh is stripped away, the bones are left, the skeleton, and then the osidax move in. So these osidax, they look a lot like trees, though they're quite small, um, and they've got this sort of trunk that extends into these palps, which take oxygen from the seawater, and they're very much like coconut leaves. And then we've got this very big root structure. And that root structure burrows down into the bone of the whale and sucks out nutrients, which is how the um, osidax feed. But what is so cool about these osidax worms is that researchers, when they, were, when they discovered them in 2004, until very recently, were finding all the worms they were observing were female. And they just couldn't understand where were the males. Well, turns out, they weren't looking close enough. So, this is a female, again, but this little blob here, that's a male. And so it turns out the males are all these little tiny blobs that basically have these hooks, and the hooks attach to the female worm, and there it stays for its life, giving her sperm as she needs, until the sperm runs out, it withers away, it dies, and she replaces it. And <laughs> some... <laughs> I'm not done yet, I'm not done yet, don't worry. So, uh, <laughs> so, what is most amazing to me about these Osidax worms is that the larger and therefore older worms, female worms, tend to have larger harems of males. Sometimes up to 200 males per individual, okay? All I'm saying is, oh yeah, these ladies have got it right. <laughs> so, 
Moving on, the snarer. So this is a female anglerfish. It was filmed for the first time earlier this year at about a kilometer depth. Um, and we know that female anglerfish actually grow to be about 60 times larger than their male counterparts, about half a million times heavier than their male counterparts. That tends to happen a lot in the animal world, but you know. So this is the male right there. Um, and in the deep ocean, it's really hard to find a mate. It's dark and there are not a lot of animals in a very big expanse, especially in the water column. So the male, instead of sporting this luminescent lure that the female has here, the male actually has really large eyes and really large nostrils. And it has those so that it can sniff out his lady. So when a male spots a female, or sniffs her out or whatever, um, he's so overwhelmed by her amazing charisma, her incredible scent, her fantastic looks, that he bites her. And <laughs> when he bites her, that prompts a hormonal reaction that causes his lips to fuse to her and begins to dissolve away his organs. <laughs> So once that's done, it turns out their circulatory systems also fuse, weirdly. I mean, the deep sea is a very weird place, okay? And so this pair then creates this symbiotic relationship where the male essentially becomes a dangling testes on her side, giving her sperm for as long as she may need or her entire life sometimes. And that is just absolute, <laughs> absolutely bizarre. And I think, you know, he gives her sperm, she gives him everything she needs to live. Haven't we all had boyfriends like that? Yes. So, I think her face says it all. <laughs> okay, so last, last example. Number one mom, apart from my own, of course. Um, this is Grinellidon Boreo Pacifica. It's an adorable octopus found off California. And this octopus is really special because it's been found to, once it lays its eggs, it broods them for an incredibly long time. In fact, for 53 months. That's nearly five years, okay? This octopus just sits with the eggs for five years. So scientists were able to, they know this because they were able to go back to the spot and she was always there next to her eggs or on top of her eggs. And over the entire 53 months, they watched her, her skin sag, her eyes cloud, lose weight, become more ragged, and they never saw her eat. She probably did eat a little bit, but not a lot. And that's because her number one focus was her eggs. And so it's likely, you know, the scientists went back at some point and all the eggs were gone and she was gone. And so they kind of had to come to the conclusion, given you know, what a lot of octopuses do, is that they die once the eggs have hatched. Sometimes the babies eat them, it gets really weird. But you know, in this case, she was shown to have the longest brooding period of any animal, and not just the longest brooding period of any animal, but also she's the longest lived octopus. Most octopus only live for about one to two years, but this one, the brooding period alone sort of knock that out the window. So I'd like to end with this quote. This is a quote from Pliny the Elder, who was a Roman author, naturalist, philosopher. And he said, by Hercules, in the sea and in the ocean, vast as it is, there exists nothing that is unknown to us. And this was about 2,000 years ago. At this point, the deep ocean exploration just didn't even exist. And this is the exact kind of mindset we need to not have. The ocean has so many more secrets to give up. There are so many more things waiting to be discovered. And we need to keep investigating. We need to keep asking those questions. And it's because it's only by doing that we're going to be able to gain a better understanding of our deep ocean and our ocean and our planet. And so that we can then begin to manage it extremely efficiently so that it's here not just for us now, but also for generations to come. Thanks.